Hi, I'm Cassiany Mobley, and today we're going to be looking at what dancing was really like in Jane Austen's lifetime, or five things that the adaptations always get wrong. Now, before you go and shoot the messenger, let me just say, I am not judging the overall quality of any of these adaptations based solely on the historical accuracy of their dance scenes. All I want to do today is talk about the differences between how dances were actually done in Jane Austen's lifetime versus how they appear on film. Jane Austen lived from 1775 until 1817, and we know she attended many dances throughout her young adulthood in the 1790s and 1800s. So for the purposes of this video, we will be examining dances that were popular from the 1790s until 1817, the year of Austen's death. I will begin with a basic overview about what Regency dancing was like, and then go into some interesting historical details that the film adaptations always seem to get wrong. Now, I'm sure you've all seen a dance scene from a Jane Austen adaptation, and it probably looked something like this. This style of dancing, with long lines of couples dancing with other couples, is called country dancing, and this specifically is English country dancing. English country dancing evolved in the 1600s from a combination of Renaissance court dancing and the influence of folk tunes and popular music, and it remained a prominent part of social dancing until the mid-1800s. In Jane Austen's lifetime, the majority of dances being done at a ball would have been English country dances. For those of you who are unfamiliar with how English country dancing works, let me give you a brief overview. English country dances are choreographed in a pattern of figures that repeat over and over again. Within the dance, you and your partner dance in groups with other couples, and this grouping of couples is called a set. In Jane Austen's lifetime, with very few exceptions, the set formations would have been long lines called longway sets or squares. The longways formation was the more common of the two. Square sets, called cotillions, were popular in the late 18th and early 19th centuries, and these evolved into quadrilles, which would remain popular throughout the 19th century. Both quadrilles and cotillions were actually French dances that were heavily influenced by English country dancing and then imported to England with great popularity. But for now, let's just talk about the good old-fashioned Longways English country dance, the bread and butter of the Regency Ballroom. The full name of this formation was Longways for as many as will, which meant that there was theoretically no limit on how many couples could be dancing, and this made that formation incredibly popular. Now, within these Longways sets, the dancers would be divided into groups of three couples, and these smaller groups within the big Longways set were called minor sets. Thus, this formation came to be known as the triple minor. The triple minor was the standard longways formation in Jane Austen's day, and this differs significantly from how we dance English country dancing today. In modern English country dance, we rarely use the triple minor, and instead we prefer the duple minor, which has groups of only two couples within the longways set. Longways sets are progressive dances, which means the couples don't just stay in one place throughout the dance, but rather they move progressively either up or down the set every round of the choreography. When a couple reached the end of the line, they would become inactive for one or two rounds in the dance, and then they would dance back in, progressing in the opposite direction. So, if they had been progressing down, they would now be progressing up, or vice versa. Here's a clip of a couple being inactive at the bottom of a set. Allow me to congratulate yourself. Such superior dancing is rarely to be seen. Day -day, I understand. I'll not detain you one moment longer from your bewitching partner, sir. Pleasure, sir. Capital, capital. So that's a very basic overview of what English country dancing was like in Jane Austen's lifetime. Apart from the country dances, there were a few other types of dances you would find in the ballroom. One of these dances was known as a reel, in which groups of couples would alternate between a weaving figure known as a hay and showing off their fancy footwork in elaborate setting steps. In Pride and Prejudice, Darcy asks Elizabeth to dance a reel with him while she's staying at Netherfield taking care of her sister, but of course she declines. The last dance of the evening was usually a circle dance called La Boulangere, in which active couples 
would alternate between turning their partner and turning the members of the opposite gender as they moved along the circle. A certain Regency dance master suggested to use Sir Roger de Coverley, the ancestor of the Virginia Reel, as the last dance of the evening, but there's very little evidence his suggestion was implemented, and none that Jane herself ever danced Sir Roger. But that's enough about the different kinds of dances you would find in the ballroom. Let's move on to the five things that adaptations always get wrong. Number one, the tunes. Popular dance music in Jane Austen's lifetime sounded like this. That first tune was a waltz, and the second was a jig. Lively jigs and reels influenced by Scottish and Irish folk music were very popular at the time. All the dance music would have been played at a lively tempo, and although the waltzes would have been played at a slower tempo than the jigs and reels, they still would not be as slow as what we consider to be a slow waltz today. And aside about the waltz now, which some of you may have heard before, the waltz, as a couple's dance, was considered far too scandalous for the ballroom. You're touching your partner around their waist. Waltz music, however, was very popular for English country dancing. So, English country dances set to waltz music would be historically accurate, but couple's dancing would not. So that's what Regency dancing was like. It did not sound like this. or this. Or this. Those first two tunes are both from the 1690s, which makes them at least a hundred years out of date for Jane Austen. And the third tune was from even earlier in the 1600s. So my takeaway from this section is, proper Regency dancing should only be done to contemporary Regency music, and the tempos should be fast, even for the waltzes. Number two, the footwork. Regency dancing was all about showing off your fancy footwork, and no step would ever be walked. In addition to all the fancy setting steps we see in the period, the traveling step would have been a chasse step. And some figures would have ended with a jeté assemblé. And if you don't know what these ballet figures are, don't worry about it. And for waltz time dances, the open waltz step would have been used throughout. So remember, in Regency dancing, footwork is everything, and walking is a choreography fail. Fail. Also fail. Number three. The figures. Because English country dancing remained popular for such a long period of time, various dance figures came in and out of fashion throughout its history. We know which dance figures were popular in the Regency based on dance manuals from the time and other primary sources. Certain iconic figures from earlier English country dances were hopelessly out of fashion by the Regency. These figures included turning single, siding, and arming. If you see these figures being danced in a Jane Austen adaptation, it's a dead giveaway the dance that they're using isn't actually from the Regency. <sighs> Some of the figures that were being used were stars, slipping circles, corner turn, haze, down the middle and back, and rights and lefts. And of course, you had to include a lot of music for footing it aka showing off your fancy steps. Number four, the First Lady. Starting in the mid-18th century and continuing on through the Regency, it was customary for ladies to choose the tune and the figures for each country dance of the evening. For the most part, dance tunes were not paired with a specific choreography, so it was up to the lady to choose dance figures she thought went well with whatever tune she chose. The lady who chose the dance would be given the position of honor, a 
at the top of the set and she would be expected to lead dance for her fellow dancers. In Jane Austen adaptations, you hardly ever see a woman choosing a dance. Ladies and gentlemen, the town square. And you never see her calling one. Number five, the courtesy start. This phrase refers to the fact that in the Regency, only the first lady and her minor set would start the dance and the rest of the dancers would remain inactive until the first lady progressed down to dance with them. That meant if you weren't close to the top of the set, it could be five or ten minutes before the first lady danced down to your position, and the whole time you would just have to stand there across from your partner, inactive. But this period of inactivity would have been a golden opportunity to converse with your partner and get to know them better. And this is actually when all those conversations in Jane Austen's novels that took place during the dance actually happened, not while they were dancing. Which means this period of waiting is when Lizzie and Darcy would have had their famous conversation in the ballroom. And this explains why Lizzie was so desperate to make small talk with the man she hated. It was either that or stand there in silence for 10 minutes in utter boredom. No Jane Austen adaptation that I'm aware of has ever shown a courtesy start. Even historical dance groups don't use a courtesy start, and it's certainly never used in modern English country dancing. And the second and more important reason is that it's just really visually boring to film a room full of dancers where most of them are just standing still. And look how beautiful this simultaneous start is. One. So that's my list of the five things to list them all. We would be here all day. Thank you for watching.